Members of the Hobart and William Smith Colleges community, it is my honor to officially proclaim the 2015-2016 academic year open. Colleagues and returning students, welcome back. And a special welcome to the classes of 2019. To preside over today's opening ceremonies, it is my honor to present President Mark D. Guerin. Thank you very much, Professor Newland. Please be seated. Welcome to today's convocation ceremonies. I am joined here at the platform by four outstanding students, and I would like to begin with that introduction. The presidents of the respective student government leaders, Kimberly Gutierrez, president of the William Smith Congress, and Michael Ortiz, president of the Hobart Student Government. May I ask you to stand? <laughs> the real presidents here. And student trustees, William Smith Sr. Nicole O'Connell and Hobart Sr. Max Gordon. <laughs> Provost Dufamata, Deans Bear and Gallowet, Professor Newell and Ruth, Chaplain Charles, and our Title IX coordinator, Susan Lee, the chair of the Board of Trustees, Maureen Zupan, members of the faculty and staff, students and our Geneva neighbors, welcome, welcome all to convocation. On this late summer day, we're called together as a community to celebrate the opening of what promises to be a remarkable academic year, one marked by excellence in the classroom, in the performing arts, and on the playing fields, and one in which we hold ourselves and one another to the highest ideals and standards, both as intellectuals and human beings. We welcome back 170 Hobart and William Smith students who studied across the globe in 18 countries this past spring and over the summer. They return to our campus with a new perspective and ideas that will enrich our classroom and campus dialogue. And today, as we gather, there are 149 Hobart and William Smith students attending uh, our global education programs in 19 nations around the world. And we especially welcome the newly arrived members of the classes of 2019. With enhanced academic preparation, quality measured by rank and testing and greater diversity in interests and service leadership, the classes of 2019 are among the most engaging and vibrant we have ever enrolled. From 35 states and 18 countries, nearly half the class enrolled early decision, making Hobart and William Smith their first and only choice. 20% multicultural students from 445 high schools, 63% public high schools. And 118 of the incoming class are legacy students, one of the highest numbers in our history, to have a parent or a sibling or a close family member who is an alum or current student. They've all successfully navigated orientation, thanks to our great students, volunteers this year, and so we welcome all of them. Like the students that they will mentor and teach, our new faculty members were selected from a competitive pool of candidates. The newest members of the faculty and staff join extraordinary colleagues who work each day to distinguish the colleges as a place of academic expectation and outcomes. And so with gratitude to this community that has been our home and with appreciation for the responsibilities entrusted to me and in anticipation of the promise of the year ahead, I convene these exercises. We're fortunate today to have our new chaplain with us, the Reverend Morris Charles. He comes to us from Stanford University where he was Associate Dean for Religious Life offering support to students, faculty, and staff. In addition to being a pastor, he holds a PhD from the University of Chicago. He's taught graduate and undergraduate courses at Stanford, Chicago, Northwestern, and Case Western Reserve. And shortly after arriving, Reverend Charles commented that he was moved by the dedication and the passion of many members of our community. And in just a short period of time since his arrival, Morris has proven that he's equally dedicated and passionate about the colleges, and I welcome him to the podium. 
Reverend Charles. President Guerin, Provost Ufamata, trustees, esteemed faculty, and esteemed colleagues on the rostrum, thank you for your gracious invitation to offer a word of welcome. Returning students, welcome home. And to the classes of 2019, 2019, some of us recall a time when 2000 was so far away that we imagined that we would travel to and fro in hovercrafts in the 21st century and have fully automated homes that would do our chores for us. Well, things didn't quite turn out like we expected, but that's not to say that we are disappointed. The most exciting thing about this brand new era is before us now, and it's all of you here. You, with all your experiences, achievements, qualms, and quirks, all of you. Welcome, class of 2019. You belong here. Like you, I have the great privilege of being a first year. Do you recall the moment when you first felt that you belonged here? Here instead of someplace else? When I first visited, make no mistake, I had a grand time from the thoughtful conversations to the salad fork and cocktail test, I mean, uh, delicious meals. But two moments stand out in particular. The moment I fell in love with the colleges and the moment I knew without a doubt that I belong here. When I had a break from the long meet and greet marathon, I happened to walk through the religious studies department and there was a little sticker on Michael Dubkowski's door that read, did you know I am a first generation college student? I thought about that first time that I walked into a 385 seat lecture hall as a first year and how much it would have meant to me to see such a sticker on any one of my professor's doors. When I saw that sticker here, that was the moment I fell in love with Hobart and Wayne Smith Colleges. After asking around, I learned the simple, wonderful gesture of hospitality was the brainchild of William Smith Associate Dean Lisa Kinzig. Small gestures matter. Communities are built or destroyed one small gesture at a time. When I shared this wonderful story with Professor Heather, Heather May of the theater department, she had her own story to share about the small gesture that made her decide to come here. And I'm not going to share her story, but I invite you to ask her, what was that one little thing the second moment that confirmed my place here was after I arrived driving from Cleveland, Ohio, clad in wrinkled shorts, keen Newport sandals, and my favorite t-shirt, black of course, I wear a lot of black, with the Oakland Peace Center logo on it. I thought I would try heading to public safety without changing clothes. I wondered what kind of community I was in. What would happen, I thought, if I just walked in, no jacket, no collar, no tie, no doctoral gown, just my frumpled self? What would happen? I walked in. There was a serious but cordial gentleman behind the window, and he greeted me with the uh, customary, may I help you? I started, I'm the new chaplain, Morris, and before I could say Charles, he threw up his hands, flashed a smile, and said, oh great, we've been waiting for you. Welcome to Hobart and William Smith Colleges. And with that, he handed this stranger the key to the chaplain's house. I got his name, his name is Jeremy Harefield. He's a native of Geneva. Such a small gesture. It doesn't take much imagination to figure out why in this current climate, this small gesture was such a big deal. I'm learning that Hobart and William Smith and Geneva as a whole are communities built on small gestures that matter. And so we invite you class of classes of 2019 to 
Bring your own creative small gestures of hospitality to help us widen the circle of friendship. And yes, even challenge us on those rare occasions when we fail to live up to our highest expectations. You belong here. Listen for that message in everything that you hear today. Remember it in the dead of winter, after the exam doesn't go quite the way you expected or your crush banishes you forever to the friend zone. Welcome to a new academic year. Welcome home. We belong here. Thank you, Morris. I believe you can measure the relevance of a college or a university by looking to its alumni and alumni. At Hobart and William Smith, we have extraordinary alums at the forefront of virtually every industry, individuals who've used their education to forge fascinating careers, ones that are rooted in the values that we hold dear, intellectual curiosity, purpose-driven and grounded in equity and service. So we're very fortunate today to have one such alum join us to offer remarks. Maureen Collins Zupan from the William Smith class of 1972. Over the years, Ms. Zupan has brought pride to her alma mater during these years as a financial advisor through service on numerous boards and not-for-profit organizations. She's been a member of the Board of Trustees since 1994 and has spent countless hours advising the colleges, providing leadership, on the campaign for the colleges, and has funded scholarships, coordinated reunions, and worked in large and small ways to enhance our community. She was a first-generation college student in her family. She majored in mathematics, graduating from William Smith magna cum laude, and is a member of Phi Beta Kappa. And since that matriculation, nine members of her family have attended Hobart and William Smith creating a remarkable family legacy. In 2012, Maureen Supan was elected chair of the Board of Trustees. She's the first William Smith graduate to hold this role and the first woman to serve in this important, prestigious position. And her leadership has been critical to the successes in the past years. And we are forever grateful for the time, attention, and the compassion she has shown for Hobart and William Smith. As she enters her last year as chair of the trustees, I've asked Maureen to speak to us today, to share her reflections with all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, the chair of the board of trustees, Maureen collins Zupan. Thank you, President Guerin. A special welcome to the classes of 2019 and also to the new members of the faculty and staff. You are beginning your first year of your formal association with HWS, and I am beginning the last year of mine as I finish my time on the Board of Trustees and as its chair. 47 years ago, I attended my freshman convocation, and now I have the great privilege of making this year's convocation address. While my comments are directed to the classes of 2019, I hope the rest of you will find value in them. Signing the matriculation book, shaking hands with President Guerin, being greeted by your deans, and now this, the ceremony that marks the start of the academic year. All of it means that you are now officially Hobart and William Smith students. I would guess it feels pretty good. It took a lot of hard work to get here. You did it, you're here, you made it through the first day of classes, you have started college. I hope you're feeling good about it, but I also hope you feel uncomfortable. And if you don't yet feel uncomfortable, I hope I can convince you over the next few minutes to get uncomfortable for the rest of your college career, for the rest of your life. You see, if you cruise through the next four years sticking with what you already know, what you already understand, things that come easy to you, knowledge that doesn't challenge your beliefs, people you already know you agree with, you will graduate from these colleges no smarter and no wiser than you are today. I know because I nearly did just that when I was a student. Some background. 
As Mark said, I'm the oldest of six children, the daughter of, that was my New York City accent right there, the daughter of a New York City cop, the first person in my extended family to go to college. I didn't even know how to go about applying. I applied to Yale, Fordham, Georgetown. They all wrote back to me saying they didn't accept women. I had no idea there was such a thing. Luckily, my guidance counselor steered me to a small liberal arts school in upstate New York. The decision to attend was helped by a generous financial package. Here are the actual pages of calculations, believe it or not, I still have them, that my parents did in 1968 trying to figure out if they could afford to send me here. The annual room board and tuition was just under $3,000. My financial aid covered all but $300 of that. In 1968, even that was a real stretch for my family. The campus was a different place in the late 60s, different because many buildings here now weren't even a dream then, different because there were rules, lots of rules. For example, if a woman left her dorm after 7 p.m., she had to sign out saying where she was going, and she had to be back in her room by 11 o'clock on weeknights. No co-ed anything. In fact, no men in women's dorms and no women in men's dorms ever. Women lived and ate their meals on the hill in the dining hall in the basement of Comstock, served by Hobart waiters. Hobart students preparing for a career in the military practiced their marching on the quad. All first-year women took a phys ed class called Freshman Fundamentals, in which we were taught how to walk in heels like ladies. And all freshmen were supposed to wear a beanie, here's mine, until the football team scored its first touchdown. And it was a very, very bad year for the football team. Within two years, everything changed. There was an active anti-war movement on campus. Those archaic dorm rules were gone, along with the beanies. The curriculum had been upended. There was huge national publicity about a riot on campus. Relationships with Geneva were dismal. And men who flunked out were drafted almost immediately into the military and sent to Vietnam where thousands of my generation were killed in a war that the United States eventually lost. I used the change in curriculum rules, which basically allowed us to graduate as long as we took 35 courses, almost no matter what they were. I used that change to avoid classes that made me uncomfortable in favor of what came easy to me, math, chemistry, and physics. And it worked. I ended up graduating Phi Beta Kappa, magna cum laude, but without the full education I should have had. It wasn't until almost the end of my senior year that I took an English class. We had to write a 10-page paper. I spent all ter term writing that paper while many of my classmates wrote it in a week or less. It was the hardest work I ever did here, but it was also my most consequential course because by being forced to write, I learned to write, and it eventually became easier to write all of which benefited me in my career and in life, even more, frankly, than the math that I love to this day. Until that course, I had stayed comfortable in my coursework and got great grades, except for the D in freshman fundies. But I missed out on the opportunity to discover new intellectual passions. Don't make my mistake. My class, the class in 1972, was one that thrived on discomfort. We never stopped challenging the norms of the campus and of society. We were leaders in the anti-war movement, the women's movement, and the civil rights movement. We demanded change in the country, the world, and on campus. When we were getting ready to graduate, we told the administration that we wanted to take over programming for the commencement ceremony or we would boycott it. So they let us. We marched in as one class, not separated by college, and did it to the Beatles' Let It Be. We had the first student speaker, now an important commencement tradition, and we awarded diplomas to each other, announcing the next person's name, handing them their diploma, because we thought we had learned so much from each other and wanted to recognize that. 
the minutes of the Board of Trustees meeting the following fall reported, and I quote, the campus is much quieter now that the classes of 1972 have graduated. We were a class that created discomfort. My challenge to you is to be uncomfortable. Start right now. At my convocation, the speaker said, look to the left, look to the right. One of you won't be here next year. That was a terrible way to start college. But I want you to do something similar. Right now, look to the left, look to the right, pass the people that you're sitting with. Pick out somebody you don't know. Go to them at the end of convocation. Introduce yourself. Go have dinner with them. And when you do, sit in Saga on a table that's far from where you usually sit. You see, you didn't just come here to learn facts and acquire information. You came here to be part of a community of people, professors, deans, advisors, coaches, staff, fellow students, People who want to help you become an educated person, become wiser, have worlds of experiences, and prepare to lead lives of consequence. There are people who came here before you who have had those lives of consequence. A common element is that they did so at first by being uncomfortable about their journey, their challenges, maybe about their fear of failure. And I want to tell you about just some of them because they are your history now. Almost 200 years ago, Hobart College was founded as Geneva Medical College. A plucky woman named Elizabeth Blackwell decided she wanted to be a doctor at a time when there were no female doctors in the United States. She applied to 22 medical colleges and only Geneva accepted her, but in a non-traditional way. Because her application was so outrageous, the dean had put it up for a vote of the students. Those students thought it was a gag and decided to retaliate against the dean by unanimously voting to accept her. And she showed up. Imagine how uncomfortable she was. But if you look closely at the statue on the Hobart Quad, you will see her words. I cannot but congratulate myself on having found, at last, the right place for my beginning. Here's another. In the early 20th century, Hobart College was having some financial problems. Lore has it that Geneva businessman William Smith offered to donate $500,000 if the college admitted women. Hobart rejected the offer. So in 1908, William Smith established William Smith College adjacent to Hobart College. Over time, it became a coordinate arrangement, but you likely wouldn't recognize it today. The two colleges shared facilities and teachers, but classes were conducted in duplicate. Women students weren't even allowed on the Hobart Quad. Eventually, the impracticality of the arrangement caused changes. Classes became co-ed, commencements were held jointly. Women could cross the quad, but had to wear skirts when doing so. The coordinate model was evolving. For many years, the coordinate system has allowed the colleges to push the envelope on societal changes. When women weren't expected and certainly not encouraged to have careers, our two stu student governments ensured that women always had a place at the table for governance issues and leadership opportunities. Men knew that to be true here and went out in the world expecting it to be true there. Women demanded it here and went out in the world demanding it there. When I started my career and for many years after, I was often the only woman in the room or the first woman promoted to higher levels of responsibility. Because I was used to men and women working together here and separately, it never felt unusual. Sure, it was uncomfortable sometimes, but because of my experiences here, it's what I expected to be given opportunity and to be recognized for my capabilities. The coordinate system keeps evolving as society evolves even today. No longer is gender binary without change, it's fluid, and what better community than ours to explore what that means, what it can mean to society, how we can help society continue to evolve. So that's a little ancient history. I want to give you just a couple more recent examples of people who found themselves uncomfortable. Bill Scanlon, class of 1948 and the most generous donor in the history of the colleges. 
He and two classmates took over the meal service for Hobart when it was bankrupt. They were juniors. Talk about being uncomfortable. They certainly knew their classmates weren't going to withhold criticism of the food. Those three young men parlayed that gig into the Saga Food Service Corporation that eventually serviced 458 institutions. Celeste Lopez, class of 1980, legally blind since she was three. Nothing she has done in her life has been comfortable. After HWS, she graduated from law school and now is the deputy chief of the Civil Rights Bureau in the Kings County DA's office. She said that at HWS, supportive faculty gave her a lifelong appreciation of optimism and confidence. She never said, I can't. And because we're in front of Stern Hall, I must mention my friend Herbert Stern, class of 1958. Sometimes you will find yourself in an uncomfortable situation because of who you are, your values, your heritage, your religion, your perspective. Know that you don't have to give up who you are and what you love in order to succeed. As one of the few Jewish students on campus in the 1950s, Herb certainly recalls sometimes feeling uncomfortable and isolated. When he was here, all students, regardless of religion, were even required to attend chapel. He went on to have a storied legal career with books written about his exploits. From his uncomfortable experiences came a hunger to succeed, and years later, the gift to fund the construction of the academic building behind me that bears his name. So, you are here to have worlds of experience and to prepare to lead lives of consequence. My challenge to you is to do so by being uncomfortable. You're gonna start by meeting that person you just looked for. You're gonna do it by taking some courses you think you couldn't possibly like or benefit from. You're gonna do it by joining a club or activity that you could never have tried before. You're going to spend time getting to know at least one of your professors every term really well. And you're going to sometimes sit at a different table in the dining hall with people you don't know. You're going to partner with members of the Geneva community to apply what you're learning in the classroom to the real world. You're going to go, you're going to leave campus for a term to immerse yourself in a community someplace in the world where you will be the person who is different. And in May 2019, you will proudly walk across the stage in front of Cox Hall, knowing that you are a more educated, wiser person. I'm a product of an HWS coordinate liberal arts education, a proud member of the William Smith class of 1972, and even prouder to be, your, to be chair of your board of trustees. I'm proud to have married a Hobart classmate, to have two brothers-in-law who also graduated from Hobart, and to have three sisters, a daughter and a niece who graduated from William Smith. There have been members of my family on this campus every decade since the 1960s, and now the 10th member is a sophomore. I promised not to embarrass him by singling him out or by saying that his name is Nick Dosky, so I won't. <laughs> and I hope I just made him uncomfortable. Here's to a great academic year full of learning, growth, and uncomfortableness. Thank you, Maureen, for that inspiring talk. Blew me away. As the Dean of Hobart College, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Hobart student speaker. Each spring semester, students elect one rising junior from each of the colleges to serve as non-voting member of the Board of Trustees for one academic year. In their senior year, student trustees become voting members of the board. This year, that Hobart student is Max Porter whom I have had the pleasure of knowing since his first year on campus. A senior from Dundee, New York, Max is majoring in architectural studies and minoring in political science. He has served as a resident assistant, is a member of Kappa Alpha, and returns to campus from a semester abroad in Rome. Max.
Dear members of the classes of 2019, welcome to the colleges of the Seneca and to the heart of the Finger Lakes, Geneva, New York. I would like to offer sincere congratulations to each and every one of you on your acceptance to Hobart and William Smith Colleges, a place that for many has grown to symbolize personal growth and nostalgia. You are all about to embark on the beautiful journey of liberal arts education. And this autumn at HWS, as the leaves begin to change, so will you. So here's my advice for you to the classes of 2019. Prepare to intensely question and investigate yourself the world that your eyes see, as well as the places that your eyes have yet to see. At HWS, plan on your passions being heightened, and if you are brave enough, your passions are in danger of being reinvented. Ladies and gentlemen, you are not being asked to reinvent the wheel, you are simply being given the opportunity to reinvent yourselves, a notion that is both terrifying and overwhelming. But understand that in front of you lies an amazing opportunity to discover just what it is that makes you tick and the opportunity to rigorously pursue that rhythm. This transition to higher education is difficult and can be frustrating. All at once, you will be asked to entertain social endeavors, academic obligations, and the pressure to perform from the world outside of Hobart and William Smith. You will soon learn sleep is irreplaceable, procrastination is a gamble, and that inspiration is not always obvious. And for the sake of your sanity, I ask that you all come to view your education at HWS as a process rather than an end result. The learning that takes place here is highly personal and contextual. Please understand that your takeaways from this experience will likely be different than those of your peers, and that is the way it is meant to be. And I argue that one of the most amazing parts of this institution are the people who are brought together by it. Ladies and gentlemen, take a good look around this audience because whether you realize it now or not, these will be some of the best teachers and friends you have ever known. I know that they have been from me. As I sat some years ago where you sit, I would never imagine that the unfamiliar faces and names I was surrounded by would come to have such a positive influence on my life, but they have. Do yourselves all a favor and start shaking hands. And to the members of the classes of 2019, this is my greatest wish for you all simply to know one another. I will never know what opportunities I've missed out on because I didn't know someone's name, and they will never know what they have missed out on for not knowing mine. Of all the books in the HWS College store, there are none written about you, at least yet. And to the members of the classes of 2019, wherever you may go after it is all said and done, go with all of your heart, for too many go with just their head. I wish you the best of luck. Welcome home. Good evening. My name is Catherine Gallouette. I'm the Dean of William Smith. And as the Dean of William Smith College, it is my honor to introduce Nicole O'Connell, William Smith student trustee. Like Max, Nicole is a voting member of the Board of Trustees. Majoring in international relations, she's very involved with campus leadership roles, including serving on William Smith Congress. She also participates in a number of volunteer efforts, like the Geneva After School Program. She has served as an organizer for HWS Colleges Against Cancer and was selected to participate in the Clinton Global Initiative University. Ladies and gentlemen, Nicole O'Connor. Thank you, Dean Gallowet, for that introduction, and special thanks to you, President Guerin, for inviting me to speak today. To the members of the classes of 2019, you may recognize me from the Orientation Spirit Squad, we had a great weekend, and I offer my congratulations on making it through your first day of classes. I hope you are all afraid, and I hope you all cry at least once this week, because you have multiple roommates, your professor already assigned homework, you miss home, and you are constantly getting lost. Guess what? I was in your shoes, 
and look at where I am now. Somehow I've convinced all of these people to trust me with a microphone. When I was a first year, every day before class, I would look at my campus map and pretend to not be overwhelmed. I would slap a smile on my face and a flower in my hair, even though I wanted to just talk with someone about how hard everything was. What I learned is that it's okay to feel lost, to not know what you want to do with the rest of your life, to fail and make mistakes. It's okay to miss your family, your friends, your athletic teams, and your favorite teachers. It's okay. Everything will be okay. This is just the first step in your journey at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. One that will make you question your assumptions and expectations. I thought my future was over when my perfect life plan began to crumble. When I realized I didn't want to be a doctor anymore. I also remember when it started to all be salvaged within the comforting office of Dean Lisa Kenzig, across the kitchen table from the first lady of HWS, Mrs. Mary Guerin, and on the beaches of Australia while studying abroad. I learned the most about myself when I quit something I thought was my dream and switched my major from biology to international relations during my spring semester of my junior year. The very last semester that you can declare a major, people. But here I am, an example that it still turned out okay. It is because of HWS, the faculty, staff, administrators, and most of all, my fellow peers, that I have been able to accomplish all that I have. My advice is to find your place here at HWS because there is one if you genuinely attempt to find it. And do not give up when your first try does not go as you planned. Challenge yourself to try again, to even try something completely outside of your comfort zone. I dare you to take a course in a subject area you have no idea about Try out for a sports team you think you will just warm the bench for. Go up to a person you think you have nothing in common with and genuinely try to get to know them. Join a club. Heck, start a club, you go-getters. Always say maybe. You never know what lies ahead. And instead of being afraid of disappointing someone else, not fulfilling someone else's expectations. Embrace the unknown, take risks, and most of all, stick up for what you love and what you believe in. You got this, people. And the only person that will ever hold you back from loving and embracing all that this institution has to offer is you. Enjoy it all, and cheers to you students of the Hobart and William Smith Colleges, classes of 2019. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. I'm Titi Ufumata, and I have the great privilege of serving as provost and dean of faculty at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor of Arts and Architecture, Nick Ruth, the 2014-2015 recipient of the Faculty Prize for Scholarship. Professor Ruth's drawings, paintings, and prints have been featured in dozens of exhibits and galleries around the world. And as a recipient of the Best in Show Award at the 2014 Southern Printmaking Biennale, he remains at the top of his field. In awarding Professor Ruth with the scholarship prize, a colleague wrote that Ruth 
was virtually, has virtually reinvented the type of artist he was five or six years ago, both in his style and his medium. He is redefining who he is as an artist and how he makes art and is receiving accolades for it. For his deep commitment to his students, in 2004, Professor Ruth was given the Faculty Teaching Award. He joined the faculty in 1995 and holds degrees from Pomona College and the Meadows School of the Arts at Southern Methodist University. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Nick Roof. That sounds kind of impressive. Who is that guy? Uh, and the sign, as if we need to have any more evidence that it's been a long career already, I have to put on my reading glasses. Uh, thank you, uh, Provost Ufamata, and greetings to you, President Guerin, members of the board, uh, my colleagues on the staff and faculty, returning students, and, of course, uh, the classes of 2019. It's an honor to have the chance to speak to you this afternoon, especially to have the opportunity to welcome those of you who are the newest members of the Hobart and William Smith family. It's an honor because you are already an accomplished group of people. You are successful students who have completed high school, excelled on tests, produced creative works, competed athletically, and served your communities in a wide variety of ways. On the basis of what you've achieved, you've also gotten into a great college. So I'm impressed, and I'm glad you're here. Now that you're here, you've got some things to consider. What has gotten you here has been being good at things. You've done a lot of figuring things out over the years, figuring out what the rules are and what people want from you, and then you've practiced and improved and gotten really good at things. And what you have learned is yours. You know it well and you own it, and you don't have to think about it anymore. But I would like to offer you a distinction to mull over. I think there's a difference between being good at things, like biology, and English, and art, and being good at college. Just what does it mean to be good at college? As far as I'm concerned, being good at college is way more difficult and interesting than being good at things. There's more to it than doing what is asked of you, meeting deadlines and showing up. There's even more to being good at college than getting involved, which of course you should do. So let me recommend an approach that I think works and that I hope you will find both effective and inspiring. As you begin this next stage of your education and your life, do the following. Do everything you can to make the familiar seem strange. Why work so hard to disrupt the comfort and certainty that you have earned by being good at things? Why challenge the assumptions that you've been raised with? Well, there are lots of good reasons, but here are two of the best. One, by recognizing how what you take for granted makes you a person of privilege, you will become a more compassionate person. And two, Relying less on all the mental categories that tell you how something should work puts you and your senses back in charge so you, with a sense of discovery and wonder, can figure out how it does work. In both cases, newness is what's at stake, and newness leads to insight and a more vivid picture of the world and your place in it. The novelist Walker Percy, who was also a serious student of semiotics, wrote something on this subject. His 1975 piece called The Loss of the Creature is an indictment of the deadening relationship between systems of classification and consumerism. For instance, he goes on at length about just how difficult it is to really see the Grand Canyon because of the way in which we inevitably and unavoidably compare that experience to everything we've ever seen or heard in the past about what it's supposed to be like. Having been sold an ideal version of the experience in advance, we snap a picture, feel satisfied that expectations have been met, and head to the gift shop. He has similar things to say about education, so I don't really want you to read his essay, because if you did, you'd probably drop out and go surfing, and I wouldn't get to stand here in this nice dress. But I'll offer one quote that animates my theme. Percy says, I propose that English poetry and biology be taught as usual, 
but at, th but that at regular intervals, poetry students should find dogfishes on their desks, and biology students should find Shakespeare sonnets on their dissecting boards. Percy is saying to students and to teachers, and to anyone who will listen, that when the familiar becomes strange, through trauma, or surprise, or passion, or force of will, or transcendent teaching, something alive happens, and that something is learning, the kind of learning that feeds your soul. So, at this time of beginning, I challenge you to reject passivity, worry less about doing what's expected, question your assumptions, pay attention to your senses, do less labeling and more discovering, do get involved, use your voice to test your beliefs, make the familiar strange, and get good at college. Who knows? You might just learn something. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ruth. And now, to conclude, we welcome to offer staff remarks the college's new Title IX coordinator, Susan Lee. Susan Lee was selected from a national cohort of candidates, and she oversees our effort around sexual and gender-based misconduct. She impressed our search committee and me with the breadth of her expertise in compliance and education and outreach in Title IX. She has decades of experience from previous appointments in Indiana, and she brings us compassion and understanding and deep commitment to these issues to our campus. I'm privileged to welcome our Title IX coordinator, Susan Lee, to the rostrum. Susan. Thank you for your kind introduction, President Guerin. Like many of you, I am new to the colleges. This summer, I've been warmly welcomed by our community. I know that, like me, you're going to love it here. As you reflect on the start of your college experience or the start of a new year, Maureen and I and many others are reflecting on our college days. As a Title IX coordinator, I'm particularly remembering what it was like to be a woman. Actually, we were called girls then but what it was like to be a woman during my first year at Purdue University. This was about three years before Maureen's experience. Women students had a curfew, men did not. The doors to the women's door, dorm locked at midnight, and if we had to ring the bell, we were sent to judicial affairs. There were essentially no athletic programs for women in high school or colleges. One of the oddest things was that Purdue had a dress code for women to come into the library. Women were not allowed into the library in slacks. A skirt or a dress was required. It was absurd. But I was part of a group of women who made a point of wearing slacks any time we went to the library, and we went to the library a lot. <laughs> the next year, there was no dress code. Then we lobbied to change the curfew, imposed only on women, and we succeeded. I can still remember the joy of walking across the quiet campus with two women friends, out to get a burger at 3 a.m. just because we could. We made changes. These early successes seeded my passion for social justice and led to exciting experiences in the years that followed my graduation working for fair housing, lobbying for the League of Women Voters, and ultimately my current career. Sometime asked me about working for the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment in the last state that passed the ERA by one vote, or lobbying to block a couple of environmentally disastrous reservoir projects. Working together with like-minded people, we accomplished significant things. To, re to remind me of this, I keep in my den a plaque with this quote from Margaret Mead, the anthropologist and a woman ahead of her time. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Title IX of the Education Act was one such significant change. Title IX simply requires that there's no discrimination on the basis of sex at any educational institution that receives federal funds. 
At the time of its passage, Title IX challenged our culture and it caused an uproar, particularly about athletics. People claimed that women were either incapable of being athletes or that they weren't interested in being athletes. Others argued that if women were allowed to enter the realm of athletics, it would ruin athletics for men. We now know those fears are absurd. Then we thought Title IX protected women. Now we know Title IX protects the rights of men and women and people of all genders and all gender expressions and all gender identities and people of all sexual orientations. Then Title IX profoundly changed American education for the better, but now there's more work to do. Today I challenge you to become change agents. Take to heart your bystander intervention training, speak up, be a leader, create a future where the thought of sexual violence and relationship violence occurring anywhere would be absurd. Create a future where the thought of racist, misogynist, and homophobic cultures would be absurd. You can lead us to a time when a fully inclusive, safe, and respectful college communities are as natural as women starring in sports or as people entering the library dressed as they please. I look forward to working with you on these challenges. Thank you. Well, this brings us to the formal close at this convocation where we both honored the past and celebrated it and visioned together for the promise of the year ahead. It was a privilege on Friday to welcome the classes of 2019. And as our chaplain rightly said, you belong here. Today we welcome new members of our faculty and we're honored they've accepted this appointment and we thank them for joining our community. New staff members like the chaplain and like Susan Lee, our Title IX coordinator and others who join this campus as a student-centered environment and bring their backgrounds to help us further reach our aspirations. But in this convocation exercises, you've heard some meaningful advice. First from our students. Nicole, who today turns 21. Happy birthday, Nicole O'Connor. It's a good thing we trusted you with the mic. She urged you to find your place, to never give up and take risks. Max reflected and urged you to prepare to intensely question and investigate yourself. Professor Nick Ruth's advice was to do everything you can to make the familiar seem strange. And our board chair, Maureen collins Zupan, urge you to be uncomfortable. And finally, Susan Lee, urge you to be change agents, to speak up, be a leader, take us to that future where the thought of misogynist and homophobic cultures of sexual violence and relationship violence occurring anywhere would be observed. All good advice. Absorb it. Reflect on these statements and take them to heart. One year ago from this podium, I called upon the campus community to engage in conversations about ways in which we can foster and enhance a greater culture of respect. Since then, faculty, students, staff, and alums have joined in formal and informal ways to provide ideas and suggestions. My own meetings and sessions with students in groups and in student residences have been the, among the most meaningful and important ones I have had in my time as president. And together, we provided and reviewed important input on policies, procedures, improved social base, interim measures for study space, dialogues through the President's Forum and Fisher Center, and in student residences, clubs, and organizations. We tried to employ best practices and implement relevant training. But in the weeks and months ahead, we must continue this work. While much has been accomplished to build a foundation of policies and procedures and staffing and outreach, now we must collectively work together 
to bring real life and meaning to these advances in the classrooms, in the curriculum, in the student residences, social space, dining rooms, and student organizations here in Geneva and around the world. We all know that campuses are, to a large extent, siloed. Students, faculty, staff. And then there are ranks within each. First years to seniors, assistant professor to full professor, hourly employee to senior staff. And of course, we all have our roles for the colleges. We all have our jobs to accomplish. But overarching all of this division and rank can be a campus community that transcends these silos at a human level. I've always been intrigued and uh, inspired by the African cultural tradition of Ubuntu, which South African Archbishop Desmond Tutu describes as the essence of being human. It's commonly translated as, I am because you are. It's a profound concept to me that speaks to the importance of the human connection, community, and mutual caring. In reflecting upon Ubuntu, President Clinton once made the point that when we finished sequencing the human genome, we discovered the astonishing fact that genetically, every human, every one of us, is more than 99.9% .9 the same. And yet, we spend so much of our lives, our thoughts, our self-image, on that one-tenth of one percent. So this year, I think our challenge and thankfully our opportunity is how we might take this Ubuntu essence of being human and bring that concept into our campus culture to its core. How do we exhibit the human kindness and empathy to create that desired cultural norm? I fully recognize the enormity of the task to confront the divisions and privileges that we live in society, gender and race and class and sexuality. But we're Hobart and William Smith, and we have the chance to foster a campus culture that prizes our differences as we unite in a campus culture of respect and empathy and civility. So the work ahead is hard. But given the past year and our ability to come together in important ways, I'm confident of our capacity. I'm reminded of the Cherokee Nation parable of two wolves, where a young boy, perhaps you've heard this, a young boy comes to his grandfather to learn more about his life. And the grandfather says, there's a fight going on inside of me. And he likens it to a terrible fight between two wolves, the good one, and the bad one. The bad represents anger and arrogance, division, ego, envy. And the good represents compassion, love, unity, empathy, and acceptance. The grandfather says the two are in battle every day inside of you. The grandson asks his grandfather, well, which wins? The grandfather replies, the one you feed, the one you feed. So my hope for the year ahead is that we all feed the good spirit in all of us this year, that we do so individually and collectively. <coughs> Chaplain Charles reminded us that small gestures matter, and I agree with that. This could be a year of enormous opportunity, a new performing arts center, a new curriculum designed and ready for the next generation of students, new students, new colleagues and staff bringing their many skills to our campus. But we will not be our best unless we purposefully and intentionally work to enhance our culture. A great deal has been accomplished, but more work remains and we need everyone's help. And so I open this academic year with great excitement and great confidence about the power of the gold community. 
I opened this academic year having seen the weekend and the excitement and the quality of students <clears throat> and their capacity for empathy and civility and civic engagement. And now I call forth the chaplain to offer a closing prayer. Thank you. Please rise. We are tied together in the single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. What affects one directly affects all indirectly. For some strange reason, I can never be who I ought to be until you are who you ought to be. These words of Howard Thurman and Martin King so beautifully tie things together. May you be blessed in your sleeping and in your waking, in your studying and in your teaching, in solitude and in friendship, in your work and in your play. Seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly, go in peace. This now concludes convocation and begins the 2015-2016 academic year.